are listening to a podcast from The National. In the rocky deserts of Oman, scientists have discovered something special that might hold the key to combating the extinction-level threat we face from climate change. Around the world, governments are starting to take action about carbon emissions and look at ways to cut the greenhouse gases that we produce every year that are warming up our planet. But action is slow, the choices we face are stark, and time is limited. Just how do we go about ending our dependence on fossil fuels? Green and renewable energies are increasing, and people today are more aware of the need to reuse, reduce, and recycle. But that might not be enough. By the middle of the century, experts are saying we'll not just have to cut our carbon emissions down to nearly zero, we'll have to remove carbon dioxide from the air. Failing to do so will lead to temperature rises and cause more frequent, devastating weather. Droughts will be harsher, longer, and more frequent. Storms, hurricanes, and flooding will be more severe. And sea levels will rise. So what does Oman have to do with preventing one of the most pressing international disasters that we've ever had to face? If you travel to the town of Ibra in Oman, the answer is quite literally all around you. The rocks and boulders, the very ground under your feet, hold a secret that scientists now think could be a viable, industrial-scale carbon capture and storage. In essence, experts think they have found literally a way of sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it to stone. This is Beyond the Headlines. I'm your host, James Haynes Young, and this week we're looking to the Omani deserts to see how the landscape can be used to lock up millions of tonnes of CO2 and help avert a climate catastrophe. For over 10 years, Dr. Jörg Matter, the Associate Professor of Geoengineering at Southampton University in the UK, has been studying the rocks in Oman. A few years ago, they discovered that the carbon mineralizes and forms a solid on the very rocks. They started to look at how this process was happening, naturally taking tons of CO2 out of the air every year. Once they understood the process a bit better, they started to look at how they could scale it into something that could take enough CO2 out of the air to make an impact on climate change. Here's Dr. Matter. So the process is called weathering. So, you know, with the CO2 reacts uh, together, you know, when rain basically or precipitation falls on these rocks, CO2 is dissolved in the rainwater and is reactive and starts to dissolve minerals out of these rocks. And I have to say, you know, this uh, it's, it's, it's happening with every type of rock, but the, the rocks we are looking at are, you know, the uh, ophiolites. And obviously in the Emirates and in Oman, we have the best exposure of these ophiolites. And ophiolites are, are rocks that are, uh, uh, you know, former rocks from the ocean uh, uh, crust and uh, from the Earth's mantle. And they are very, very reactive with CO2. And that CO2 dissolves just minerals out of the rock. And the process that's naturally occurring in Oman, Dr. Mata says, can be increased in speed and scale. Yeah, so there are two options, you know, in carbon capture and storage, or we call the process mineral carbonation. So you can do uh, uh, two ways, or you can do it in two ways. You can do it above ground. So, for example, you have, you know, you're mining the rock, or you already have, you know, this rock kind of crushed from, you know, road construction or, where, where, you know, from mining. So you can use that and you can use it and carbonate it in a process above ground, like, you know, in a cement factory. Or, you know, you can inject the CO2 into this rock very deep, you know, uh, uh, so below, you know, a, a thousand meters. You can inject it into the rocks and there, you know, that CO2 would react in situ below the surface. So we are, uh, you know, in terms of uh, mineral carbonation in, in the uh, ov ovulite rocks, you know, we are kind of uh, a little bit further away, but we are uh, on an industrial scale in similar type of rocks, which are called basalt. 
So basalt are also, you know, uh, rocks that occur in the ocean crust. And I was part of, uh, of a pilot project in Iceland, and the uh, whole island consists of basaltic rocks. And there, you know, we did a pilot scale project where we injected several hundred tons of CO2, and we looked how fast it reacts. And we found out, you know, for the first time that all our injected CO2 was fully carbonated within less than two years. And now, you know, the, we worked with a geothermal company. And so this company is now upscaling it to basically industrial scale. But in terms of ophiolites, you know, the next step will be a pilot project. This isn't just happening in Oman. The process happens anywhere that this kind of rock or basalt is present. Oh, yeah, there are several places. You know, this process happening everywhere you have this type of rocks on your surface. So it's happening, you know, in Northern California. It's happening in uh, New Caledonia. It's obviously happening, you know, in, in, in the Italian Alps. So everywhere uh, which this type of rocks, these ovulites, are exposed to the atmosphere, it's happening. This process isn't the only carbon captured method being studied. Elsewhere, companies have looked at capturing carbon emissions from factories or power plants and pumping it into the ground as a gas. While this might seem an easier option, Dr. Matter says his process has the edge. So really the benefit is, you know, of, of our process is that, you know, we convert the CO2 into something that is on geological timescale stable. Obviously, you know, if you pump CO2 into a depleted oil and gas reservoir, the CO2 will stay down there if if there is you know no leakage happening and uh you know we know that the geologic subsurface is not a leak proof container so they could be fractures they could be abandoned boreholes so there is a risk you know in co2 leakage from you know conventional reservoir like depleted oil and gas reservoir is much higher than obviously with our technology because we convert it to something that is environmentally friendly and maybe can also be a product you know we could get a product out of it as people and governments have become more aware of the pressing nature of climate change interest in dr matter's work has increased it has an impact because the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change report basically showed that we need negative emissions by, you know, 2030 or 2050. Yes, it has an impact, but because we are still, uh, for this type of technology, we are kind of on the pilot scale, we have to find the finances or the financial resources to actually, you know, proof that it also works, you know, in ophiolitic rocks. But the public is more aware of the big problem and that we need solutions. So the European Union, you know, has uh, basically backs and puts a lot of resources into climate mitigation and, you know, carbon capture and storage is part of it. What I would like to see is that the, the um, companies are getting interested. It can only be successful if there is a partnership between kind of the private sector and the public sector. You know, California is really pushing uh, uh, renewable energies and push uh, some carbon capture and storage solutions. They would also have, you know, the right rocks as, you know, Oman or the Emirates have. So is that it? Will the rocks of Oman solve and even reverse climate change? Well, no, not on its own. Not one scheme or one technology can save the planet. So we need, you know, multiple solutions, starting from using more renewable energies to have, you know, more better building standards in terms of so insulation, renewable energy, uh, stop deforestation, and obviously do, you know, carbon capture and storage to make fossil fuels cleaner. But, you know, it can significantly contribute to solving, you know, that climate change problem, because if we just theoretically look at the availability of this type of rocks, there is more rocks available than, you know, anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So we could have, uh, we could use it, you know, to have a significant impact. So where does Dr. Matter want to see things go in the next few years? What I would like to see in, in uh, let's say, in five years is that we have a pilot project on, you know, let's say several hundred to a thousand ton of CO2 per year in injection or, you know, mineral carbonation above ground in, in this type of settings. That's what I would like to see because we proved 
technology works. It is safe. And we convert the CO2 into something that's environmentally benign. It's environmentally friendly. It's, you know, kind of like limestone. So it's permanent storage. So it is really a, a, a safe, you know, a safe and secure solution. One of the things that could be a key driver to the kinds of projects that Dr. Matter is talking about is creating a market for carbon trading. It's a system that allows a polluter to pay someone somewhere else to take carbon out of the air, effectively keeping the system in balance. It's not a new idea. It's been around for years and there's been several trials and iterations. The European Union's emission trading system is today the biggest carbon market. But it's also been beset with problems, accusations of corruption and a lack of interest. Without obligations placed on companies and countries, such systems just haven't taken off in a major way. That said, people are trying to refine the markets and there are also others making money by offsetting people's emissions. But why would companies be interested in spending money on the kind of carbon capture that Dr. Matter is talking about? We could prove uh, that mining operations could be CO2 neutral. So that's the benefit. And in the future, you know, if there is a price on carbon, obviously, you know, then their mineral waste, you know, the waste material from the mining could be a revenue, could be income. But the whole process still needs more tests to overcome issues of scale and to ensure that as much CO2 as researchers think is actually being mineralised. Martin Vogt is a geochemist, and Deirdre Clark is a researcher at the University of Iceland. Together, they've been working on a project called CarbFix, using the same process Dr Matter saw in Oman on the basalt that makes up much of Iceland's landscapes. At a geothermal power plant about 30 kilometres from Reykjavik, CarbFix have a successful, albeit still small, project up and running. Around half the geothermal plant's emissions are captured, dissolved in water and then pumped underground, where it reacts with the rocks to become the mineral. Right now, uh, most of the hydrogen sulfide, this H2S gas, is actually turned from gas to rock. The CO2, it's it's not all of it that is turned into it, but uh, over 70% um, as it stands now. Um, So work would have to be done to ensure better efficiency, but... As it stands now, it is very efficient. That's Deirdre Clark. Here's Martin Vogt. The great thing about the CarFix method is that this happens in a matter of months or years. So compared to other carbon capture and storage projects where we um, have uh, injection into, for example, sandstone aquifers, uh, we inject into basalt aquifers here, which is a quite reactive rock, and we can turn the CO2 into stone uh, in about months or years. In a couple of years, we turn about 70% or even more of the CO2 into rock. Over longer time scales, of course, um, probably all of the CO2 is then turned into rock. While the results are promising, the scale is still small. Deirdre and Martin say that the geothermal plant produces about 3% of the carbon emissions of a coal-fired power station. But they hope with more trials that they can increase the size and tackle different types of industry as well. To do this, CarbFix would still capture the CO2 mix it with water, a process that Deirdre described as being like a soda stream, and then they'd pump it underground into dug wells. From the injection side, it's the same technology. So if you have the CO2 um, from whatever exhaust stream you have it and inject it in the underground, CO2 is just CO2. But the uh, more critical part then is uh, the capturing of the CO2, which is actually, in most cases, the most expensive step in uh, carbon capture and storage. So how do we capture CO2 from an exhaust from whatever industry that we would like to decarbonize? I mean, as it stands now, the CO2 is mixed with water. Uh, Well, in our case, fresh water. So think of a soda stream. So you are just dissolving the CO2 with the water and then, in effect, capturing it. So this is, of course, a method that has been worked on in our project. So if something similar could be applied to another industry, that would be wonderful. Of course, then it's looking into your water source. So there is a way to capture it. It's just, does that work for that particular industry or should we explore another capture method? The pair say that industries in Iceland have committed to looking at projects like CarbFix. And they also point out that there is an incentive. Well, the hope is that in the future there will be a price on carbon emissions. In Europe, there's already this um, emission trading scheme, the ETS, um, and the price for CO2 emissions at the moment is at about 29 euros per ton of CO2. 
And this is on the same order of magnitude as the cost of the CalFix method at the geothermal power plant, which is about $25 per ton of CO2. Um, so if there's an incentive there from just reducing emissions because you save money, that's, that's of course a big point. Their mineralization process, the per se, is a crucial element in the battle against climate change. As we know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so the more of this they have in the atmosphere, the more we um, enhance climate change or the heating of our planet. And the projections are that if we want to stay within the limit of about 1.5 or even 2 degrees of heating compared to pre-industrial levels, so if we want to keep our planet relatively cool or only heated to about 1.5 degrees, we will need some sort of carbon capture and storage or some sort of negative emissions in the future. And this is not the very distant future. This is timescales, something like 2050 to 2060. And at this point, it seems that we would need uh, methods that would immediately lock the carbon emissions rather than over a longer time, because so much is still being produced into the atmosphere. And it looks like it's not necessarily decreasing as rapid as we would need to. There's also one major hurdle still to overcome if this technology is to become really widespread. It needs a lot of fresh water. The other side, which is the fresh water, I mean, even if you do have the fresh water, you do need so much more compared to CO2. For example, if you're taking one ton of CO2 and dissolving it in water, you need around 25 tons of fresh water. So if you have a limited supply, it's a bit too much. The CarbFix team and others are looking at ways to replace the fresh water with seawater, something much more readily available. But there's a snag. Well, one thing that we know so far, for example, is that if you heat up seawater temperatures above about 150 degrees, you start to precipitate anhydride, which is a mineral, which is similar to gypsum or something. So you start to um, form solids out of the seawater if you heat it up too much. And if you would do that in a reservoir where you inject CO2, you could potentially clog the whole reservoir. So you have to make sure that you stay at temperatures below about 150 degrees to apply this method. Well, for me, um, my personal research at the moment is looking into how to use seawater instead of fresh water for this CalFix method, which of course would have the advantage that you can apply it in places where fresh water is a more precious resource. In Iceland, there's plenty of fresh water, so it's not a big problem. But in other places, um, there might be limits. So if we can use fresh uh, seawater for this type of method, that would have a great advantage. And it could be um, upscaled in different places. For example, you could apply also the CalFix method offshore. Most of the oceanic crust is composed of basalt. So that's the same rock type that we have all over Iceland here. So if we could use seawater for the CalFix method, that would be a great advantage. So, while the discovery of a seemingly miraculous carbon-capturing rock in the deserts of Oman has, in just a few short years, offered the possibility of a large-scale, cheap and effective carbon capture method, the technology is still in its infancy. There are more trials to be done, but it is likely that in the near future we'll start seeing this replicated around the world, possibly sapping millions of tonnes of carbon out of the air every year. Thanks to my guests this week, Martin Vogt and Deirdre Clark in Iceland, and Dr. Jörg Matter in England. To hear more, tap the subscribe button in your podcast app and get all the latest beyond the headlines. And check out more of our coverage at thenational.ae. We were produced this week by Aisha Khan and Erica El with assistance from Hannah Finity. I've been your host, James Haynes Young. <laughs>